this is a video on how to work with large groups, particularly for trainers, facilitators, um, some top tips on working with large groups of people. So, um, my name is Mark Walsh, I run something called the Embodied Facilitator Course, the normal size groups I run are between 12 and 30 people, um, however I have worked with much bigger groups, so I have a lot of experience working with large groups of children when I was younger, you know, 100 kids, 200 kids out in a field doing games and activities, things like that, you know, really crazy, so you have to have a great presence for that, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I've done corporate classes for like 150, you know, normal, often it'll be like two of us working with like 40 or 50 people. I'm thinking of one job in Spain not that long ago. Um, what else? The largest one I've done was in Russia, is a thousand people for a talk, huge auditorium, but I made it very interactive. So even though it was more of a talk, it was actually, you know, kind of a training. So um, yeah, I'm also working online quite a lot, working with fairly large groups regularly online. Um, so top tips for working with large groups of people, particularly working with the body, embodied work is my specialism, but this, you know, a lot of this is useful for any kind of trainers and coaches out there. Um, so I guess where do we start? Well, um, our key thing is safety, right? So before we do anything else, like do no harm is, is the first principle. Um, if, we, if we're doing embodied exercises, so let's take them from, from movement exercise and I can't see what they're all doing, well, that's a little dangerous, a little dangerous. Um, you know, I like to, it's, it's different if I'm on stage, I can see people, I like to have assistants that are like in the crowd checking things out. So whatever I'm teaching, I need to be um, extra sure that it's safe. Yeah, so if I've got 12 people in a room, I can keep an eye on all of them just by standing in the back of the room. You know, I can be something a little riskier. Um, you know, when there's 100 people or 1,000 people, I've got to set them up with things that can't go too wrong, right? I don't want people being traumatized. I'm gonna, um, let's say there's a calibration piece around like, okay, think of something that makes you stressed on a scale of one to 10, make sure it's about a five. We're gonna use this to um, think about our fight, you know, feel our fight flight response. So I'm doing it mentally. I'm not getting them to grab each other, for example. I did that in the early days and that can go wrong in big groups. Um, you know, because it grabs much more likely to upset people, like thinking, and with the thinking one, even then I'll say make it a five out of 10, where I might normally say seven out of 10. I'll give some examples, I'll be, be you know, extra clear about that. Um, you know, that's an example as, as well of how you can work with a large group of people. Instead of having to do something physical with them, you can just get them to do it in their imagination. Yeah, um, Short things people can do. So from an embodiment point of view, I might get them to do something with their hand, like, you know, be limp, be tense, be extended. That's something you can get a whole room full of people to do very easily. You can ask them to change their posture. So we work with the basic principle of awareness and choice. I might say to a room full of people, okay, notice how you're sitting just right now. Notice how you're sitting. Imagine if that was a huge statue in the desert. That's something I got from a yoga teacher years ago. Um, okay, now sit how you'd like to be. And the whole auditorium of 100, 200, 1,000 people shifts their posture. Yeah, so real safe, real easy. You can get everyone to do it at once, no big deal. Um, I'll get them talking to each other. I'll say, okay, find a partner. Why have you come? Please tell them why you've come. Yeah. Um, and then I might take 10 responses from a large group and say, can you put your hand up if, um, if, if this applies to you? If the reason you've come is why you've come. So you don't have to ask a thousand people, right? But you can get general sense of like, okay, they want this, they want that. Um, how to stop people talking is a big one. Uh, the bigger the group, the longer that will take. So the more time you should give in terms of exercises with the bigger groups, because it's crowd control time. Yeah, so in, you know, if I'm working with two people, I go, okay, stop, cheers guys, that's an end, no. Working with a thousand people, it might take a couple of minutes to, it's like trying to stop a tanker, like an oil tanker, it takes a bit of time, yeah? Um, so we like to have some system, like I like to establish the hand system, where if you put, I put my hand up, you put your hand up, it spreads like a wave. Uh, Paul Linden uses a sh spreading shh sound, that can work too. Um, what else? Bells are okay, but you know, in like an auditorium with a thousand people, they won't hear the bell, right? This is where assistants come in. Um, this is where having music and lights you can change, flash the lights, things like that. <laughs> Little tricks you can use in big groups, but just be aware you'll need a bit more time, basically, um, to stop them talking yeah, in their pairs. Um, other things you can do in a group that are helpful, I'll do like a mood check. Everyone does this. I'll do an energy check. Uh, so any check is like you say, right, if you've got low energy, your hands down, medium energy, your hand in the middle, high energy, hand up. Uh, make sure you do it with a thumb up. If you do it this way around, it looks like a whole group of people doing Nazi salutes, which isn't cool, particularly in some countries. Um, so that's an example of how you can mood check a whole group at once because you can't hear from everyone and you want to, you know, I don't want to brutalize them, right? I want people to be, uh, I want to check their energy level, see how they're doing. So um, yeah, there's some little tips there. Um, of bullet pointing instructions. So whereas with a group, I might say, okay, blah, 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 here's the instructions. With a large group, say I'm teaching a centering exercise, um, I would have them on the board or on a big PowerPoint. 
you know, normally I wouldn't PowerPoint instructions, you know, but when you've got 50, 100, 200, 1,000 people, you need to have like, do this, do this, do this, do this. Really, really concrete, or you'll spend like loads of time on questions, or people will be confused, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, what else can you do in large groups? Like walking around the room, that's an embodied exercise I do a lot. You can still get people moving, it doesn't have to be, you know. Again, crowd control becomes a problem. Um, presence, this is the really big one. So, um, inexperienced facilitators, I would recommend walking with small groups. Not too small, because that actually can be more intense. Uh, kind of eight to 12 to 15, maybe eight to 15. Is, is really a good size for beginners. That's a sort of natural number of people. It's not too few. If you have too few, like one asshole can kind of ruin the whole group for everyone. And people want to like engage in conversation about everything. Every, it feel weird if not everyone has a say when you have six people. Whereas when you have 20, if only three people speak, that feels okay, yeah? Um, yeah, so with, with beginners, I think it's better to work in smaller groups. Over time, you can build that presence to hold space. What does that mean? Well, there's a somatic part of actually being able to take space to be big in your body. Voice projection, uh, more than that, you can use visualizations to think of encompassing the whole group or imagine there's a big triangle that you're a part of going somewhere. You know, this is something Wendy Palmer talks about. Um, and it's just the capacity we have to contain and it's emotional as well. I know the first time I did really big groups, I got like super big emotional hangovers the next day. I was like depressed and stuff, you know? Uh, and I'm told by musicians and performers that's normal, normal. So the bigger the group, the bigger the buzz, particularly if you're extrovert, so that's gonna be fun. So be ready for the adrenaline hit of that. Your like self-regulation needs to be better. Yeah, and I think you just build up over time, you know, for me now doing a talk for a few hundred people isn't that big a deal, whereas a few years ago it would have been like just got practice of the containment aspect, but also the self-regulation that's needed from the adrenaline here. And I deliberately like won't have a cup of coffee before a big talk because I, I know I'm going to be stimulated, you know, um, so be ready for that stage fright, that stimulation. You don't have to be perfect. Remember, if I'm nervous, I'll just name it. You know, I'll just be human. I just say, hey, guys, you know, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many people. I feel a bit nervous talking to so many people and just naming it like everyone trusts you more. That's a positive. Yeah. Um, so it's normal to be nervous. It's normal to kind of have a, a hangover the next day. Uh, also to get a bit inflated. Your like, ego can be really big, uh, I find, if you're not careful with this. Um, with bigger audiences, you see that with rock stars and comedians and stuff, right? And uh, it's a perfectly natural human process. I used to see that when I worked with kids outdoor activity instructor. Um, you know, people would come in quite humble and after a few months of like talking to 100 kids all day long, they'd be like these huge personalities. And, you know, sometimes I'm with my wife at dinner or whatever and I'm having dinner with her and uh, she's like, Mark, just, just calm it down. You're not talking to 50 people now. Like you have to be a bigger size. Even on the internet, you have to be big. And um, you don't have to do that with, when you're sitting with one person having a coffee. So not getting habitually big would be some of the risk of that. Um, so yeah, I guess the key things there are developing your own ability to self-regulate, your gravitas, your charisma, ability to hold space. Um, the ethical side of making sure you don't do anything that's potentially dangerous or triggering for people, like making it extra clear in terms of the instructions, having systems for kind of room management, allowing extra time. Uh, kind of some of this I do intuitively, so I'm kind of thinking here what I do, what I don't do. Um, they're the main pieces though, in some ways it's still got the same cycle of training, you can still use the same principles of embodiment, like awareness and choice, familiarity, contrast, exaggeration, etc. For those of you who are my embodiment students. Um, yeah, not the place to like learn new stuff either, I would say. Not the place to be like, yeah, I think I had a student who was like, the best place to try this out would be with 200 new people in Tel Aviv. Not such a smart move. So, um, yeah, first thoughts, getting a bit long this video now. So. Um, you have millions of people are watching this and this is a big audience um but we you know whatever you're working with i think should be helpful as i said i've got quite a bit of experience with that so hopefully these tips will be of use